Mm -hmm. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. This is February the 3rd, 2019. You can hear the organ playing. That's Greg Nolte, our organist, is playing the organ prelude. Our pastor, Pastor Pollock, will be leading the service today. We have Holy Communion. St. John's is located at the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia, right across from the hospital. <clears throat> Reverend John Pollock is our pastor. We have morning services at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and mid-service, midweek service on 6.30 p.m. <clears throat> we have communion at the midweek service every Wednesday. The nursery care, we have Holy Communion celebrated the first and third Sunday of each month, festivals and every Wednesday evening. Nursery care is 10.15 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. every Sunday. We welcome you to St. John's Lutheran. I see Pastor Pollock will be uh, leading the service briefly. We open our service always with confession. <laughs> Lutherans believe in confessing our sins before others just as God commanded us to do, to confess our sins to him and also before others. We do this every Sunday. Pastor Pollock leads us in forgiveness of sins and we receive forgiveness from him through, through, from God through Pastor Pollock. You can see now the choir is getting ready to process. We're going to have a Holy Communion this Sunday. We have our order of confession and forgiveness is the first thing we have. Then the opening hymn will be God of grace and God of glory. Then the apostolic greeting, the hymn of praise, the prayer of the day, first lesson in the psalm. The theme today is love. We'll be reading this, the very famous uh, book, 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter on love. And the whole service today will be devoted to love. Jesus is love, God is love. We believe that we receive forgiveness of sins, we confess, we repent, we love God and love our neighbors. Then we are called Christians, we're followers of Christ. We welcome you to St. John's Lutheran. The flowers today are on the chancel stands. They're to the glory of God and presented by Doug and Lynn Mitter Holzer and family in memory of Mom Sue on her birthday on February the 2nd, 1927 in honor of Sandy Kramer's birthday, and also from the Pollock family, in honor of Gina's birthday and pastor's anniversary of his ordination. This is the anniversary of Pastor Pollock's ordination. Pastor Pollock will now lead us in the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, declare me the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father. 
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now begin our worship with God of Grace and God of Glory, hymn number 705 in the back of your worship. Hymn number 705.
Let us pray together the prayer of the day as it is printed on the top of the today's reading insert in your group. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. May be seated as we listen to the reading of God. The first reading is from Jeremiah, the first chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God. Truly, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, <coughs> For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck down and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have 
been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. Word of God, word of life. singing the anthem choir is directed by Vicki Perks and organist is Greg Nolte. Listen to the choir singing the anthem for today.
C.H. Spurgeon, the great 19th century preacher, who, being a Baptist, preached 45 minutes to an hour every Sunday, usually three times a Sunday, had advice for young preachers. He said, if you have trouble with your voice, and losing your voice, said, take a glass of water and pour a tablespoon of olive oil in it, stir it up and drink that. I would hate to do that and then greet you all after church. I can't imagine I'm drinking an olive oil. It would make your breath be like after preaching. So I'll take a lozenge any day to get a glass full of olive oil. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you may remember a movie out around 2000 or so called A Few Good Men starring Jack Nicholson, Tom Cruise, and Debbie Moore. Well, the story was about a young Marine being killed at the Marine compound at Guantanamo Bay and the pursuing trial and court-martial. And while the court-martial is going on, Jack Nicholson, who plays Colonel Jessup, the leader of the Marines at Guantanamo, was on the stand. And Tom Cruise is asking him questions, and they get to a, a heated exchange, and I forget Jack Nicholson says something, and uh, Tom Cruise responds by saying words of effect, if I just want the truth, to which Jack Nicholson <coughs> responds with words that have become quite famous, especially in movie tri trivia, responds by saying, you can't handle the truth. That is reality of the world in which we live. Few of us can handle the truth. Whether it's the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, or whether it's somebody telling us the truth about ourselves. Most of us, if we would be honest, would admit that we really don't like people who hurt us with the truth about ourselves. I can't imagine how devastating it must be to a young musician or a young actor trying to break into the profession and being told by a teacher or a record company or whatever, you just don't have it. And telling them the truth. And instead of leading them along and giving them small roles, they say, you just don't have it. And that happens to us in daily life. People sometimes will tell us the truth about ourselves. Uh, whether it's something about our personality or how we are acting or doing our job or whatever. But, of course, today we want to focus on not handling the truth of God's Word. Because people don't like to hear the Word of God, throughout the centuries, preachers have been killed and even driven off. The prophet Amos was told to leave Israel because of his proclaiming the word of God. Jeremiah, who we read from this morning, was thrown into a pit by the king of Judea because of his message that the people needed to repent. Jesus, as we read this morning, was rejected by his hometown, and of course, as his ministry continues, he's rejected by the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and everyone else with power. St. John Chrysostom was exiled from what would be modern day Turkey. And Martin Luther was branded an outlaw of the Holy Roman Empire, meaning that anyone at any time or any place could kill him and not suffer repercussions. Why do people not like the truth? Why do we not like to hear the word of God even though it may cause us pain? As we read in our gospel lesson this morning, verses 28 and 29, we read, When they heard these things, all of the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town. Why in the world? Would people become so upset with Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that they want to drive him out of town and throw him off a cliff? Why does the truth 
hurt so much. That is what we need to examine this morning. What is it about Jesus Christ and God's Word that people hate to hear? And why do they hate to hear? First reason demonstrated in our gospel lesson today is that the gospel deflates our ego. All of us have an ego. No matter how humble we may be, we still have an ego. There's a good side to an ego. An ego motivates us. An ego gives us goals and uh, dreams and things we want to aspire to or want to accomplish. But then ego has a negative side when it, we start thinking that we're better than everybody else or that people are below us for some reason or another. We see egos in the world of professional sports and college sports and high school sports. We see egos in the world of entertainment, where we're talking about actors in movies and TV and actresses, although I guess now they use the term actor to cover both. We see it among musicians, we see it uh, among singers. Uh, all aspects of life, we can see people filled with an ego that makes them difficult to work with or unpleasant to be around. So Jesus comes to his hometown and the people's egos are bursting with pride because they're here and they have heard what Jesus did in Capernaum and they're thinking, wow, we're in his hometown. This is where he grew up. Just think of what great things he's going to do for us. Not one stopping to consider whether or not they believe in him or whether or not they understand he's the son of God and the savior of the world. All they can think about is the glory. And unfortunately, when it comes to egos, we even see them in the life of the church. The one place where we are supposed to be humble where we're supposed to be a servant, where Jesus reminds us the first will be last and the last will be first, where he tells us the greatest good is to be a servant to one another. Even within that environment, we see people with egos. We see people who think they are deserving of more than what they receive. Now there's egos among clergy. I remember the first Senate Assembly I went to, some fellow introduced himself to me and carried on like he was my best friend, and after he left, somebody told me, you know why he did that, don't you? <coughs> no, why? He said, he did because he thinks he should be bishop. When the bishop retires, he wants your vote. And this guy had quite an ego about himself. So of course, he never got elected bishop either, because his ego had rubbed too many people the wrong way. So when Jesus is in Nazareth and he deflates the people's ego and all he does is heal a few sick people and goes on. He deflates their ego because through his, what he says in our gospel lesson, he is telling them they are as great as they think they are. They're just like everybody else. Jesus says in verse 23, Doubtless he will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. They're putting demands on him because of their egos. You do hear what you did there. Because we're your hometown. We deserve twice as much. Well, the will, word heal means to do service to. So they're saying do service for us. And the word do here means bring something into existence, to perform something, uh, and to do something spectacular. All because of your ego. We're your hometown. You should do this for us. The problem is they have no faith. They have ego, but they don't have faith. And when Jesus responds with those words in verse 23, that deflates their ego. And then he deflates it any more, even more, when he goes on uh, to talk about 
the prophets Elijah and Elisha. I will get to that in a moment. So deflating our egos, thinking we deserve something because of who we are or where we are or what we've done. So that's one reason why the truth hurts so much. Because we don't like to be told we're not who we think we are. We don't like to be told that we don't, aren't special above anybody else. We do not like the truth because it reminds us that to God we're all the same. Second reason the truth hurts. It convicts us of sin. Jesus goes on in verse 24 to say, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. With those words, he is convicting the people of sin. Their sin of pride, the sin of their ego being overinflated, the sin of no faith. They are not looking at Jesus as to who he is, the fulfiller of God's promised Messiah, the fulfiller of those prophecies. They are looking at him for what they can get. So when he says no prophet is acceptable, he is convicting them of that sin. Acceptable means to be a favorable decision towards someone. So he's saying, you're not making a favorable decision towards me because I'm not doing what you want. The word means to value something or to approve them. They didn't value Jesus for being the Son of God, the fulfiller of prophecy. They just value for what he could do to bring their town uh, no, uh, fame and fortune, acclaim. So the people reject Jesus, just like people reject Jesus today, because people today don't want to hear the truth about sin. They don't want to look at sin as being that which can bring about eternal condemnation. They don't want to look at sin as that which separates us from a relationship with God, that it fractures that relationship with God, and there's not a thing we can do about it except through faith in Jesus Christ and His death upon the cross, paying the debt of sin that we owe. And then on that third day, He rose again to liberate us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. But you'd be amazed today how many people don't want to hear that good news. Because we live in a life that has made so many advances in such a short time. I can remember the first cell phones when they came out. They were big old bulky things. And then it seemed like the phone companies got in a race to see how little you could make a cell phone. My first cell phone was about that long and only about that wide. Now they're getting to be big again. You know, I see these people walking around. Their cell phone's about this long and this wide. Their screen's almost as big as the first TV we had when I was growing up. Because of this, we think all oh, sin is not sin. It's just misbehaving. All we got to do is say we're sorry and that's fine. Or they don't want to hear that they're guilty of sin. Because they think they're a good person. I do good things. I help my neighbors out. I'm nice to the people at work. I'm nice to people I meet in public. I never act snobbish. I never act stuck up. I'm a good person. So why wouldn't God love me? Well, God loves you. But to have his eternal love in the kingdom of heaven forever, you have to believe in his son, Jesus Christ, who repairs that fracture that you're misbehaving, as you call it, brings a fact because it's sin. And God cannot tolerate sin. God cannot be in the presence of sin. So people don't want to hear the words, I need a Savior. I've had more than one conversation with a person and they tell me, flat on my face, I don't need a Savior. I don't believe all this stuff about having to be forgiven for sin. My goal what do you consider when you do something wrong? What do you consider when you tell a lie? Somebody at work or you cheat on a project to get all the glory and really you didn't deserve it. One of your co did. 
Or what do you call it when you do some kind of other act against someone? Oh, well, all people do that. I love that excuse. Oh, everybody does it. Yeah, like everybody may do it, but that doesn't make it right. So that's why God sent us Jesus Christ to forgive us of that sin. But, as I say, some people don't want to hear that. So the truth hurts them when they hear that about sin. About there's no way to have forgiveness of that sin except through faith in Jesus Christ. They don't want to hear it. They want to believe their good deeds will make it up. And they think they're a good person. But it doesn't matter how good you are. You are going to sin by either thought, word, or deed every day of your life. And probably commit all three of them every day of your life. Sinning by thought, word, and deed. And there's only one remedy. There's only one answer. There's only one Savior. And that is Jesus Christ who redeems us from sin, death, and the devil. Not with silver or gold but with his holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. That is how we repair, not we, that's how our fractured relationship with God is repaired by Jesus Christ. So people can't handle the truth about sin. They don't want to be reminded of it. They don't want it to be brought to their attention that no matter how good of a public a persona they have, they actually are a sinner. A sinner. Who, without Jesus, becomes a sinner in the hands of an angry God worthy of condemnation. But when believing in Jesus Christ, becomes a child of the Heavenly Father, an heir to the kingdom, a co heir with Jesus Christ to all that he won for us through his suffering and death. Resurrection and ascension. So that's the second reason people can't handle the truth. The third reason is Jesus reveals our prejudices. Everybody, and some of you are going to believe me, or some of you might be insulted by my saying this, but the reality is everybody is prejudiced. Prejudice, not a big, there's a difference. A bigot is when you hate somebody just because of their race, their creed, their color, their ethnic origin, their religion, or whatever, and you have no reason. It's just something you, you were taught. But prejudice simply means you have a preference for things. It's to prejudge things. And so Jesus reveals our prejudices. He reminds the crowd of God's action of Elijah and Elisha. And as he told him that when the famine was going on in Israel, he, God sent Elijah to, um, not to any of the Jewish widows, but to a woman, a widow in Zarephath, the land of Sidon, when she was a Gentile. And then in the days of Elisha, there were all kinds of Jewish lepers. But Elisha only cured Naaman, who was a Syrian, a Gentile. And so the people's prejudice is shown as we read that they become enraged. So they thought Gentiles were beneath them. They thought Gentiles had no hope of salvation unless they converted to Judaism and still it was, there was a question as whether or not they would be to go to the paradise of the chosen people. They had misconstrued what God had meant when he made the covenant with them at Sinai, that they would be his people and he would be their God. They were to be his people, to be a light unto the nation to the world. They were to show the world who the real God was and what he was like and what he expected. And that no, they weren't chosen in the sense of God just loved them. But that was the common perception of Jesus' day. God just loved them. They were the chosen people. And this developed over the years of being dominated and being in exile in Babylon for 70 years. And they come back and they have some years of peace. And then the Greeks come in and, and conquer them. And then they're gone. And then the Romans have conquered them. Uh, and so they developed this thing of, of prejudice against Gentiles. 
Now that didn't keep them from making friends with some Gentiles, but they were prejudiced. They just didn't think they were as good as they were. And so Jesus reveals our prejudices that we have towards others or things or whatever. I am prejudiced against certain colors. No reason, I just don't like them. I don't wear them. You better not buy it. Bring them home because they're going back to the store. I don't like Chicago or New York City because where I was raised, Chicago and New York City were the eagles of the north. And you didn't want to go anywhere near New York or Chicago. And having lived by Chicago for eight years, my prejudice towards Chicago is even greater than it was before I lived by Chicago for eight years. And the same thing with New York City. After being there for our middle son's wedding years ago. I am prejudiced towards certain colleges because they are rivals with my college. And I know a lot of you sitting out there are prejudiced against that state of north, as Woody Hayes used to call it. And I wouldn't see you wearing maize and gold for all the money in the world because you're a buck outfit. I know there's probably a few misguided people that are Born and raised in Ohio, for some reason, like that state of war. But see, that's a prejudice. You don't like Michigan because they're Ohio State's oldest and biggest rock. I have prejudice against certain food. I just won't try. I mean, just the salmon. I mean, squid. What's it? Squid. I like mean, calamari, but I'm not eating the stuff when they serve it. And a, a fella in, in um, Griffith area in Florence had been in the army. He was in France and he ordered this dish. And he said it was basically fish and rice and he was digging through all these old pieces of fish and stuff and he thought, the big stuff's got to be at the bottom. So he pointed his fork to the bottom of the bowl. Suddenly this tentacle shot up and wrapped around his fork. I'm not even squid or octopus or bear or elk or deer or rattlesnake or muskrat or raccoon I didn't have a prejudice against them. They're wild animals. I, if it's not a cow, a pig, a lamb, a turkey, or a chicken, I don't eat them. And I've had people try to sneak some of that other stuff in on Made my prejudice go up even higher. It was horrible. But so we all have prejudice, even when, when we try to deny it. No, we have prejudice on the cars we buy. I know people who will buy nothing but a Ford. I know other people who buy nothing but a Chevy. That's what they won't even look at a Ford car. And they won't look at a Chrysler. They're either a Chevy person or a Ford person. That's it. I know people who are prejudiced about restaurants. You know, they've had, they went in, they had one bad experience, they'll never go again. But it's not the same as being a bigot. So we all have prejudices. And if Jesus tells us the truth, that like the people in that synagogue, we have all these prejudices, but we don't want to admit it. They were filled with wrath. That means rage and indignation. Rage and indignation, simply because he was showing them how God would, showing love even toward the Gentiles. The word heard means to understand. They understood what Jesus was saying. He was hitting them right in the heart that they had this prejudice that they needed to, to get over because they were supposed to be a light to the nations. They weren't supposed to be keeping their relationship with God just within the Jewish community. They were supposed to be spreading it to the Romans and the Syrians and the Samaritans and everyone else. The word drove literally means to eject someone from someone, to expel them, to send them away so that you never see them again. The gospel, sometimes the truth of the gospel hurts so much, that's how we feel. We want to send Jesus away. Don't remind us of our prejudices. Don't remind us of our misdeeds towards others. Don't remind us of our bad thoughts that had no basis. Jesus reminds us, especially when we start thinking to highly of ourselves, we are all the same in his eyes and the eyes of God. 
You can't handle the truth. Jack Nicholson said. And it is true. We cannot handle the truth when it convicts us of sin, when it deflates our ego, and when it reveals our prejudices. But Jesus reminds us not only about the truth about ourselves, but he also reminds us that in him there is forgiveness and everlasting life. Peace of God which passes all understanding in your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We will now sing He the Pearly Gates will open, which is inserted into your heart. He the Pearly Gates will open, inserted into your heart.
they may be sustained in their afflictions, healed according to the Lord's gracious will, and brought to perfect healing in the life to come. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for our stewardship of the earth and all the resources God has provided, and for the honest labors in which the Lord is glorified and our families and neighbors are served, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for our deliverance from all human and natural disasters, for an end to war and pestilence, and for relief workers in their service to those so afflicted. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord and for us to follow them in their faithfulness, especially under persecution and threat. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the saints, remembering God's mercy and his presence in time of help in time of need, let us commend ourselves, one another, our supplications and prayer, and indeed our whole life to Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Time for our offering. You see the ushers coming forward with the offering plates and they're passing the offering then to the people. After this will come the Holy Communion. I want to tell you about the last hymn that we have today, Praise Ye the Lord the Almighty. It was written by Joachim Neander. This was an early Reformation hymn. This will be the last hymn we sing as you're watching the, the uh, service today. It's written by Joachim Neander in 1680. Him was written by him. His father, great grandfather, great great grandfather, they were all ministers. Joachim Neander was also a minister. He was, his family had the Neander Valley, and the Neanderthal bones were found of the early uh, people who are now extinct. They were found in Neander Valley. This is written by Joachim Neander. He was dying of tuberculosis in 1680. Early Reformation hymn written by Joachim Neander. Neanderthal Valley, where the Neanderthal bones were found in early extinct humans, extinct uh, beings. They were found in Neanderthal Valley. This hymn is named for him, Joachim Neander.
anguish at all times and in all places. Give thanks and praise to Almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, he proclaimed him your beloved Son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels with the church on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join there in any hymn.
thrice given to you. Body thrice given to you. Body thrice given to you. We've received Holy Communion. We believe that God is with us, and we give him thanks that he is with us in truth today in our Holy Communion.
Thank you for watching this video. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. It's February the 3rd, 2019. This is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, where anytime you can come here and worship at 10.30 service, 8 o'clock service on Sunday, we had 8 a.m. service, 10.30 a.m. services on Sunday mornings. Wednesday, we have midweek service at 6.30 p.m. You can also receive Holy Communion every week, the midweek service. We believe in receiving the body and blood of Christ as often as we can. We pray to the God of salvation, that His bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united, united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. We set forth now with the power of your Holy Spirit that we may proclaim your redemption for your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us for this service, February the 3rd, 2019, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. We welcome you to come anytime and join us here at St. John's for our worship services.